Okay, Ben. Let's know when it's nine thirty. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's here and on the uh, board members and then the uh, club members that are on the uh, go to meeting. Uh, I'd like to start by calling the meeting to order. Uh, we have a forum, uh, both here in person and some on the phone. Okay, the first order of business are the four sets of minutes from March 24th, March 27th, April 8th, and April 17th. And I'd like to propose um, uh, ask for a motion to accept all four of those uh, without together. Um, a second? Second. Okay, anybody have any comments or, uh, or suggestions on the, I think everyone's seen the minutes, so this is really just the, the amended minutes. Any, any comments? I, okay, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, this is Charlie. I have a... Uh, a question about the April 8th. Okay. That, uh, that I don't know if it's appropriate here. I, I'm just wondering if they, uh, if, if um, Mark Metzger has made any progress with those massive bridges. Um, Charlie, this, Charlie, this is Tom Pinkerton. A um, couple things on the bridges I, I've talked to Mark about. He has, he's looked at uh, opportunities to do something on that. He has fixed uh, boards that were going up or any screws that were coming out. And there is signage on the bridges um, asking members to watch themselves when the bridges are wet because they are slippery. But as of right now, uh, I don't think there is a new mat on any bridge. The, the product's been ordered. Uh, they have not heard itself received, but I know Mark ordered that this week. Did you say that again? Mark ordered the mats this week. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, could I have uh, all those in favor of accepting all four minutes? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Okay, done. All right, move on here and to the president's report. Um, Okay, this past month, our primary focus has been on the safety and support of our members. That has been and continues to be our number one priority. The seriousness of the threat we face today was made very real this past month by the unfortunate passing of one of our members from the virus. We appreciate that life at Stonebridge has dramatically changed over the past six weeks and the restrictions are starting to wear a bit thin. We share your frustration. The time will come when we can emerge from isolation and resume our lives, but for now, we can't let our guard down. The club will continue to do all it can to keep our environment as safe and comfortable as possible. Our members must continue to do their part by maintaining an appropriate social distance, wearing our stylish Stonebridge line of face masks, and unfortunately, treating everyone as a possible source of the virus. In his GM report, Tim will discuss the continuing evolution of the Stonebridge response to the emergency. Tim has aggressively responded to the challenge and kept in close contact with a host of other clubs in Southwest Florida to ensure we are responding with the best of our peer clubs. In this regard, we'll also have a report from our crisis response committee on the work so many volunteers have done to help protect our members by creating face masks, a response to the emergency that is just so Stonebridge. Volunteers stepping up, organizing, and sharing their work with everyone. Though clearly secondary, Tim and his staff have been working closely with Dave Hopper and the, our excellent finance committee to respond appropriately to the financial challenges we face. Particularly impressive is the work Tim and Debbie have done to secure federal funds focused on assisting small businesses in these difficult times. It's a remarkable story and one best shared by Tim. 
While these times are financially challenging, I think you'll find comfort in the work that's being done to keep Stonebridge financially strong and stable. While the majority of our committees have been temporarily sidelined, today we'll hear from our committee chairs about the plans for when the emergency has passed. We, you know, we once again can keep our focus on Stonebridge as being the best bundled golf community in Southwest Florida. So these are the actions we're taking and planning to take. No reason for gloom and doom, just an unexpected and inconvenient pause in the activities and amenities that we hope will pass soon. The work is impressive and always is, but let me take a minute to talk about two other pieces of the Stonebridge story that I believe sets us apart from our We're very fortunate to have Tim and his team working on our behalf. As I mentioned last month, when an emergency like this hits an organization, a knowledgeable and experienced staff rises to the challenge. Tim, Ben, Chef Liam, Eric, Mark, and the rest of the team have worked tirelessly to respond quickly and help us stay safe against the virus we cannot see. When the possibility arose of obtaining federal loan with very payable terms, Tim and Debbie literally worked day and night in the face of a well-intentioned but sometimes struggling federal bureaucracy. We have a great appreciation for the work Tim and the team do on a regular basis, but this challenge has shown us just how fortunate we are to have them on our team. The other part of the Stonebridge story is more difficult to put your finger on, but something we all know exists, the Stonebridge spirit. Let's face it, these times are difficult and scary and downright inconvenient too, but the Stonebridge spirit has made it tolerable. Whether it's making and sharing protective masks or offering a simple hello and stay safe, up to a passing walker, the spirit of Stonebridge keeps us positive, hopeful, and ready to return to our social selves. So let's continue to support Stonebridge and take care of ourselves and others as we pray for this emergency to subside and like to return to normal for us all. Okay, uh, Tim, do you want to present the general manager's report? Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words. So, member communications. To date, we have had um, 26 updates that have gone out since this pandemic has started. Um, we have a great read rate on those uh, emails, over 53%, or 53% is the average read rate on those communications. Uh, so, that's over 1,000. There's over 2,000, like it's about 2,000 that go out, so that means over 1,000 are reading each of those updates. Uh, the social distancing and gatherings, uh, less than 10, um, we larger than 10. Uh, the members have been doing a much better job of adhering to that. Um, the, the club and the board took some action about a month ago with the removal of the rest of the furniture outside the bistro and some, um, let's say, stronger language and encouragement when it comes to the practice areas. I think that that's been, been paying off. Um, we'll, we'll continue to update the members and remind them about the need for social distancing, not only at the practice area or at the pool where there's no furniture, but even through the common area, there's, there's a lot of people walking, jogging. Um, so we need to keep that in mind everywhere. The status of the club operations, we'll start with food and beverage. Member feedback on the F&B takeout has been very positive and the members are quite appreciative. Um, we continue, uh, we will, we plan to continue lunch takeout from the beast roads at the end of April, and then we will reevaluate that based on utilization. Uh, I'll have all the statistics in my report, which will be online and emailed later, but on average, uh, we're serving 100 meals per day between lunch and dinner, and um, the he more heavily supported is the dinner service. We had the pleasure of being a part of providing some uh, Easter dinner to about 300, a little over 300 via the takeout. And again, members were very supportive and appreciative, appreciative of that. The farmer's market, which is going on right now, was very well received when it was rolled out a week ago with over 200 members uh, visiting for fresh produce and seafood. This will continue every Friday, Friday morning from 9 to 11 for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have team members, as we do right now, working outside to ensure social distancing. And our policy, which was not published before last Friday's uh, farmer's market, but we published this week, our policy for the farmer's market will mirror that of the golf course when it comes to guests. So this is intended for members, renters, and family house guests. And we're also asking for the protection of everyone that those that, that go wear masks and gloves, and we have... Um, We'll provide gloves. Most members are wearing masks, and we do have some disposable masks that we can give 
uh, for those that don't have it. You can expect to, also on food and beverage, you can expect to see some videos pretty soon from the F&B team. This will be everything from everywhere from how to make specialty cocktails to uh, fruit carvings with Indra and uh, cooking classes with Liam. In fact, Liam's being videoed right now picking fresh produce from the farmer's market so we can make a uh, little cooking demo with the product that's right here in the, in the uh, club. As far as golf goes, uh, golf remains surprisingly busy with about 150 to 180 rounds per day. That's a slight drop from where we were a few weeks ago, which was about 200 per day, uh, which is not surprising based on the summer heat that we're feeling out there. We'll continue to remind members to stay hydrated. We have had to assist a few members getting off the golf course. We've been publicizing in the updates, the phone numbers for the golf shop, the bistro, and the grill room. And I think it's a good idea for all members to have that program in their phone. That way, if they or someone in their force and needs assistance, uh, that they can call someone here at the club and we can run out of the golf cart and pick them up if needed. Uh, of course, if it's a true emergency, always call 911 first. Uh, we have not decided about the reciprocal season yet. At this point, all the local clubs are in a bit of a holding pattern until we know uh, what's going to transpire with uh, the virus. Um, tried to get a little bit of a consortium between the bundle clubs so we all kind of agree not to open up too soon because I think as soon as one club opens up it, it's going to unravel from there um, and I think all the bundle clubs that I talked to which is about 23 we all kind of agree we need to take this a little bit slowly uh, because again as soon as one club opens up that's going to kind of open up the floodgates and um, I don't think it would be wise for one club to do it on their own because then they may have uh, a fair amount of business from other clubs, and uh, that wouldn't be wise as far as the spread of the virus. As far as the pool goes, uh, again, without any furniture at the pool area, uh, that it hasn't been an issue. Uh, ben and I continue to keep keep an eye on that area. Uh, some members and guests do bring a chair, and, and that's fine. We haven't seen anything that's an issue as far as uh, large gatherings or social distancing issues outside of the immediate family. As far as fitness goes, obviously that's closed down, but Jeff has started to do online fitness classes and that's being enjoyed by, enjoyed by some of the members. Uh, there's instructions on the website under the fitness and pool section on how to sign up for that. And this, uh, we, are, we are aware of the recent suggestions by the USTA that would allow tennis to be played under very controlled conditions and in certain cities and states. The officers and I are evaluating these and other suggestions as we continue to look to look for safe and practical ways to reopen tennis, even if it is in some sort of limited way. Uh, looking forward to reopening in a safe manner. While we look forward to getting the club back up in operation, it is important to note this will be done only when it is safe for the members and the team members. To that end, I will, I will be working closely with the officers of the board to evaluate the situation and determine when we are able to start opening different areas of the operation. This will be done consistent with the guidance from the CDC and Department of Health, both locally and at the state level. Financial implications. First and foremost, as Mr. Trowell said, our focus is on, the, on our members and team members. Nothing else is more important. Having said that, the board and management must be conscious of the potential financial impact of the many actions we have taken as a result of COVID-19. While we had strong operational results in January and February, the curtailing operations since mid-March is impacting operational revenues as expected. In fact, we project that from mid-March through the end of April, our revenues, our revenues will be down nearly a half a million dollars, 500,000. And that's primarily through, obviously, food and beverage and golf, golf operations. As I noted at last month's board meeting, the, the following facts are important to keep in mind at Stone, about Stonebridge. Stonebridge Country Club Community Association, Inc. is a not-for-profit corporation. As a not-for-profit, we budget break-even every year. Nearly two-thirds of our revenue is generated by dues. And this is particularly important to keep in mind because there are clubs that rely on operational revenues to offset expenses. Uh, some private clubs that rely heavily on banquets or outside golf tournaments are in a much worse financial position because all of that business is gone. Again, the important thing here is two-thirds of our revenue is dues-based. So while we may be down 500000 in revenue, it's the dues that support the operation. 
And that 500,000, there's very little cost that go into that 500,000. So we, while we're missing that revenue, we also don't have the 43% cost of goods for the food and beverage that go along with it, other than a little bit of food and beverage we're doing. Um, so there are variable costs in which we're saving. Should also be noted, noted that the majority of Stonebridge's golf shop and dining revenues and expenses occur during the first six months of the fiscal year. That's October through March. October through March account for 72% of our revenues and 64% of our expenses. And why this is important is we don't know how long this is going to last. We're going into our slowest months with our least amount of revenue and our least amount of expenses, but we still have our due stream because we're a dues-based business. Given all the uncertainties in the next several months, defining the financial impact remains difficult. But we want to reassure the members that we are working hard to minimize the need for an assessment. To that end, as Mr. Travel said, Stonebridge was able to avail itself of the federal government's payment protection program dispersed through the Small Business Administration. As intended, the purpose of this program will allow us to keep team members on payroll for an eight-week time frame, which started in mid-April. In May, we will review our financial performance through April 30th against budgeted projections as well as what is known at that time about the future impacts, the potential future impacts of COVID-19. As a result of the SBA, PPE, PPP, and assessment will not be needed at the end of April. At the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th, there is the potential of a small assessment, depending on how long the impact of COVID-19 continues through the summer. Stonebridge is financially strong and stable. This was stated by our foundation firm RSM at the annual meeting just two months ago. Obviously, a lot has changed over the last two months, but Stonebridge continues to be financially strong and stable, and we will remain financially strong and stable. Talk a little bit about guests coming into Stonebridge. We've had some members that have been concerned because of, um, there's obviously a lot more guest activity uh, that you see in the community with younger individuals. So these are the, the facts as we know them. Over the last two weeks, we are averaging 230 vehicles entering the community through the guest lanes every day. Of those, less than 15%, or an average of 34 per day, are not business or delivery related. Of that 15%, Again, that's only 34 per day that's coming through the guest lane that's not a, a business or delivery. Of that 34, there is only a couple that are from uh, a couple of vehicles over the last two weeks that have come from out of state. And none are from the hotspots. And they say hotspots as defined by the governor um, being New York, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Louisiana. If anyone enters from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Louisiana, they will receive an additional handout. So any guest coming in receives a handout with the governor's order about self-isolating 14 days. If they come from any of those four states, then they receive an additional handout that speaks to exactly what self-isolation means. And we also then will log their information at the gate and I'll be notified if we have any, any from that area. To date, we have not. But that's not to say that somebody couldn't be here from uh, one of those hotspot areas because someone could fly in and be picked up by a member and then go through the member gate. Again, this is only what goes through the guest gate that we can be aware of. Hotwire. Hotwire, um, as we have previously published, we had them cease the interior fiber poles on, poles on April 6th. This is where they're pulling the fiber line from the first floor to the second floor. And again, we had that stop earlier in the month. I'll have a chart in, um, in my report, which will be published to the members. And it basically shows that a majority of the work is completed other than um, the fiber poles within uh, one and a half neighborhoods plus, plus a couple in other neighborhoods. They have splicing that they do. Um, that's a 90% complete on the I believe the only thing that they're lacking on right now, which the club can do a better job of communicating, is on the consultations. So every owner has to do a consultation with Hotwire. And so far, 40% of the homeowners, 40% um, of the homeowners have not yet scheduled 
their consultation. So that's something you'll see continuous uh, communication from the club as well as Hotwire. Those consultations initially were done in person or by phone. Currently, those are all being done by phone. Uh, and, they, and they can totally, it's fine to do them by phone. The one thing that they suggest is that you have a Comcast bill available when you do that call because basically what they're looking for is to find out what services you have now so that they can be prepared to do their installations in the fall so they know what equipment that they'll need. Um, they'll also be able to tell you at that time how much money you'll be able to save because you can compare what your future uh, retail costs would be, if any, against what you're paying, cost, paying Comcast right now. And again, I'll put that chart on the website so you can see where we are, but that's coming along really well. Uh, the other thing with Hotwire is they have to build a building at Golf Maintenance. It's a small building where the head end unit uh, resides, and that is in the permitting process right now in the county. Just some statistics, uh, as Mr. Powell mentioned, uh, we're always communicating with other local clubs more specifically with bundle clubs because we're dealing with things that are much more close-knit with the HOA and the club components. So there are 23 uh, bundle clubs of which we're a part of and just about weekly we do a little survey to see where everyone is operationally, what's open, what isn't. So I'll give you some of those statistics. Uh, currently, only one of the 23 bundle clubs is entirely closed. That's club operations, golf course, everything. They're completely shut down. Um, and that compares to two clubs just a couple of weeks ago. And you'll notice the trend up compare these stats against where they were two weeks ago. So you can see that things are starting to open up a little bit more than where they were, were on April 6th. 20 clubs are providing takeout services. We are, so that's 87% of the clubs. That's up from 16 two weeks ago. Four golf courses are completely closed. That is significantly down from seven clubs just two weeks ago. Nine clubs are walking only, and that is uh, up slightly from eight two weeks ago. And that number varies a bit because, because some of the bundle clubs do have uh, private clubs, so there is a difference there. 16 have uh, their tennis or pickleball closed. That 70% of the clubs have their pickleball or tennis closed. That's slightly down from 17 just two weeks ago. 12 have their pools, uh, 12 have closed their pools. So that's almost 50% of the clubs have their, their pools closed. That's actually down slightly from 14 two weeks ago. Um, 10 have members and or employees that have tested positive for COVID-19, so that's 43%. That's actually flat to two weeks ago. That's the exact number that it was two weeks ago. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a good sign. To the extent they know who that is. Right, right. 17 of the 23 clubs that I'm aware of have applied for the SBA PPP forgivable loan. We're one of those 17, obviously, so that's 74% of the clubs. And four were approved and have received funding from SBA and PPP, so that's 17% of the clubs. In closing, I just want to thank the uh, team members for the amazing job that they're doing during these challenging times. I mean, from the captain and the, and the gate access team, keeping the gates operational. Uh, our, y'all probably know that we have our in-house team, and then we have a few that are outsourced. And our in-house team has been carrying the weight of the load. Um, the outsourced help has been not as helpful. And, and some of the help that Securitas has sent have, has not, they haven't been to, let's say, Kathleen's standard. So you may see that we don't have the roving patrol on the road as much as we typically do. And that's because they're covering the gate. So while there is a little bit of operational savings there, um, it's more so to do with the fact that uh, Securitas hasn't been able to fulfill, uh, completely fulfill the post. But Kathleen and, and Catherine are, are keeping everything going. Uh, so Debbie, our controller for the Catalyst reports, uh, had her running, as I explained to the Finance Committee last week. Uh, we reached out to over, to not over, we reached out to three banks um, and credit unions to pursue the SBA PPP funding. Um, and each each of the banks had different uh, sets of information, different documents and reports that they were looking for to be able to submit. So while I was able to get my foot in the door at a bank, 
they then came back with what their requirement requirements were. Um, so I'd send Debbie off to, okay, we need this set of reports. And then I'd talk to another bank, okay, now we need this set of reports. So probably for a good week, week and a half, uh, she was generating a number of reports, not that we needed all of them, but we wanted to be able to jump at the first one that was able to accept us. Fortunately, Pinemark um, was accepted as an SBA uh, lender, and that is our banking, we have our banking relationship with, with Pinemark, so we were able to get a secure the loan through that. To Amy and Caitlin, who've been working remotely, um, they've saved the association thousands of dollars in entertainment deposits. Obviously, we had a lot of entertainment that was booked that had to be canceled some of the last minute when we decided to close down operationally. They were successful in rebooking member events and entertainment uh, to the future so that we didn't lose deposits. To Katie and Mary, keeping the members service, members, uh, service office functional all while remotely, um, especially with the need of timely communications right now. To Eric, Mark, and Jason for jumping in, uh, changing in, to address changes in how we operate in golf. To Jeff, who took the initiative to offer the online fitness classes. Uh, to Kevin, Sally, Eric, and Phil, who soon you will see uh, some videos from them on tips from the pro, just as uh, Liam is doing and, and uh, Indra with some things on the food and beverage side. Ben, Indra, Liam, and Megan have uh, officially shifted to take out operations uh, all only um, to take out only, apologize, along with delivery services as well as now the farmers market option. I'm privileged to work with so many amazing and hardworking team members. All that hard work and dedication means nothing without a membership to appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Anybody have any questions for Tim? Tim, that was a great report. Thank you. There's a lot of meat in there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, great job, Tim. Tim, yeah. Tim alluded to this, but Tim's report will be emailed out to everybody. Yeah. Both our reports will be emailed out to everybody right after the meeting. So that what he just read <laughs> through, you'll all get uh, by email. Good communication. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of meat in there. Yeah. And the fact that um, we were able to get that loan was uh, closed after. 14 days of being open, he was so proactive to the club and doing that. And again, kudos to Debbie and Dan from different directions trying to get all the reporting together so we can, we can take advantage of it. Um, the 30 banks are, the SBA publishes uh, by zip, you put in your zip code and it expands out for the banks in the area. And we went through the first 100 banks. <laughs> So we actually went through the first hundred banks to be able to. At the end of the day, we ended up with Fine Mark, which is where we started. But that's why we want to make sure that we could, if Fine Mark couldn't come through as a lender, we want to make sure we can get it elsewhere. And kudos to, to Fine Mark too for coming through. Um, not only did they become an SBA lender very efficiently, they didn't wait to set up their online portal. Uh, everything is done electronically. So while they were waiting to be approved, which they didn't even know if they were going to be, they were setting up their online portal to be able to facilitate the applications. Um, so as soon as they said go, literally we were the first client that, that they took through their SBA loan application process. Uh, and kudos to Debbie, I'm sure it's because of Pester and Debbie and I that we were the first. Right. <laughs> but they said, as soon as we're set up, um, we do have a banking relationship with, with Fine Mark, and because they have our loan, we cannot get a loan from anyone else. Because they were not an SBA lender, I have permission from Fine Mark. Uh, they were going to give us a letter so that we could go elsewhere to get that loan to get this SBA DPP. Uh, three clubs, uh, what, what lender? They received their loans through? One was Firemark. Um, there are two. I know that there's 12 clubs that have submitted applications but are in the queue. Now that there's more funding coming through, I would assume that they'll get funded as well. I know that a lot of those banks were with, or a lot of those clubs were with Wells Fargo. Yeah. So with a bigger bank, you know, you just, you're just in the bigger oh, queue. That's one of the advantages of a small bank where we were first on the list. Well, it's hard to be. Yeah. 
So Tim, could you just at the 10,000 foot level talk about what's the value of this loan to us? What, what does it mean to us? So the intent of the loan is to keep, keep it's basically a stimulus through the employer to the employees to keep employees on the table. Um, and that's exactly what we're using. The formula is, and it's, it's not like you just come up with a loan amount. There is a specific formula to come up with a loan amount. And that's two and a half times your average monthly payroll. So if you take your average monthly payroll, two and a half times that, that becomes your loan. It becomes forgivable when you spend 75% of it, at least 75% of it, on payroll and payroll related. So it's not only payroll, but it's benefits, 401k match, um, all of that is forgiven during an eight week period from the time we receive the funds. So we received the funding on April 15th, April, uh, April 15th, the eight, week eight weeks takes, takes us through June 9th. So, uh, and additionally, they have a provision to cover some utilities. Um, we're still looking for guidance on what's classified as a utility, um, but that obviously will be electric, water, uh, internet, phone, those are clear utilities. Um, there is some question out there as to whether there's some language about leases. So could that include car leases, golf maintenance leases? We need better clarification. Our our position is to take a very conservative approach with this and, and just use it to the letter of what it's intended. And um, and obviously, based on our financials, that that will be able to carry us through a good part of the summer. But more importantly, keep the employees on payroll keep them paid again that's the intent of the program. So so even though just to clarify, even though it's a loan, so so if we use it for the purposes that I've stated, that's all forgivable. So we do it's basically a grant at that. Anything that we do not use, and we will likely not use two and a half times payroll. Um, so anything that is left is paid back to the SBA. You're allowed to keep it uh, we wouldn't do that. We keep it. It's a two-year loan at a 1% interest rate. We wouldn't do that. Anything that's left, we, we would pay back to the lender and back through SBA. Um, the forgivable amount is 100% if your headcount and payroll is the same as your average uh, time period that you came up with for the, the loan amount. So our average headcount was 97 employees for the purpose of the loan. So uh, if and again, we don't have clear guidance yet on this. We don't know if the comparable on the back end is it how many full-time equivalents you have at the end of the eight weeks on June 9th. Is it the average over the eight weeks? There still isn't clear guidance on that. Um, but let's say it's at the end and we had 90 employees. So you take the seven, seven employees that we are kind of short from last year, divide that by the 97, it's going to take you to what, about 91%-ish? That means 91% of your loan would be forgivable. If you're 100%, you have 97 employees, 97 employees, if you're 100%, it's 100% forgivable. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that make sense? Good. Those are uh, what's described as favorable terms. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Good. So that's that, that, uh, that was a huge accomplishment. And now, uh, and also, um, kudos to Debbie, but Mr. Harper, He's been on uh, a few phone calls and web Zoom meetings with uh, industry experts, along with myself and Debbie, uh, from RSM to uh, Brad Stevens, industry leading uh, individual. And um, I know I now know what the inside of Mr. Harper's house looks like because I've been <laughs> a few Zoom meetings with him. <laughs> Great. Uh, that that was that was that's great, uh, and it's uh, congratulations to you and Debbie. And thank you. Uh, now the challenge is uh, just getting through the paperwork, that I'm sure will follow, as it always does. Okay, so that's the two reports. Um, why don't we go ahead and start on the committee reports uh, and we'll start with you, Bruce, Architecture Review Committee. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I think one of the things you wanted to cover was. Uh, the expectations that we had from our committee this year. And uh, we do have a full uh, plate as far as what we expect to do. If we want to review all of the uh, declarations, committed declarations in Article uh, 13, just to ensure that they're up to date and current with our design expectations, because a lot of things have changed since this community was originally 
So uh, we'll be accepting the ARC request for any kind of change to the external uh, part of our property. We'll uh, review that in compliance with all the documents and review it in a timely manner. We've set up a tracking system already, which will allow us to report back to the board each month how long it took us to consider the request, how many we approved, how many were rejected. So uh, there should be a, a pretty uh, you know, open report back uh, for each month. Uh, we'll be assisting homeowners with some of their design changes if they request. This was demonstrated last week when we had a request approved, which uh, didn't even, we didn't think met the standards we were looking for. And our committee members spent uh, pretty much close to eight hours working with that homeowner to get mutual acceptance and so everyone is happy. That will be part of our uh, day. One thing we found that uh, we didn't really have an effective system to audit change requests after they've been completed. So sometimes the paperwork was sent back to notify us that everything was completed, but nobody went back to check. You know, they requested a red door and they ended up changing the green door and nobody was white. Well, it may or may not have been significant, but uh, we'll be establishing an audit program which will allow us upon completion to go back and see how things were done so we can track it more or less in a lot of ways so the uh, Community Standards Committee can know if a change was actually approved or did they do what they said. So that basically is uh, some of our expectations. And as far as uh, the tracking report that I was uh, thinking about, this previous month we had eight change requests submitted, all eight were approved. That was down from 19 from the previous month, but obviously due to conditions that uh, is explainable. Our turnaround time was six days. You know, we're allowed 45 days by the documents. That's a little, I guess, over the top. We don't need that much time. We need to require our members to, to stick to that. Are we ever going to lead down to same day approval? Probably not. But we'll, we'll strive for improvement on that. So uh, I've attached the report which I'll send to you each month. And uh, then the question. one thing we are considering right now, and it might be good for the members to be aware of, we're currently studying uh, changing the documents to allow for Bahama shutters on the front of residences. They've always been allowed on all sides except the front. But we've been talking with some vendors and uh, some engineers, and we'll be discussing that next month. We hope to have it done this month. But, uh, because our meetings weren't allowed. What's going on? Any questions? You want any questions? <coughs> okay. What are Bahama shutters? <laughs> uh, if you are familiar with the, the Morrissey House, the Winding Hope, the Larry Winder House, and Winding in uh, Manchester, they hinge at the top and go out at that kind of an angle. That's so okay, um, Sandy. Okay, um, communications committee, the top two objectives are kind of our whole right. The first one was to devise a plan to communicate five and ten year plan to homeowners. <clears throat> so based on what strategic planning is doing, we'll work with that on that. The second is to develop strategies to improve <coughs> the growth community-wide use of the website, the app, et cetera. The third is tweaking the website as needed. The fourth one is seeing that the hot five project is completed. And that's basically in full right and all, although they are ahead of schedule, so I think it hopefully will be finished in time. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. comments? Yeah, so you, you did one of them, I think you said you were going to encourage the use of the apps. Yes. Yeah. Do we, do we that include collecting some information on how many people use the apps currently? I'm thinking about dwelling live and some of these other things that Tim's and staff have been putting in place to sort of facilitate things. Well, Katie's got an idea that I think it's a great idea is to have a cocktail party, not a class, because she's had classes before, and everyone's at different levels of what they need. Some it's one on one, some it's like, oh, I didn't know we had an app. And so having the golf shop there so that they can do uh, the golf app 
and any kind of app that can be put on phone, and uh, so you can get the help right there. Because yeah, it can tell you right now how many people are using the app and the website, and just mm -hmm. like you know, the over fifty percent. So right. it's to get people more familiar with using it. Right. Yeah. I, I think people that don't use them would be surprised at how easy they are. They are. Yeah. 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 Never right. <laughs> right. Right. Very easy. Good. Okay, great. Um, Charlie, community outreach? Yes. Um, what, the only uh, part of that committee that is active right now is me working on um, details of each one of the 50 or so uh, nonprofits that we identified uh, uh, last in last year's work. The, the purpose of this is going to be to once the voice goes back into publication that perhaps once a month we can highlight one of those organizations that include that would include information about who to contact where to go if some member wants to get involved in that organization so that's that's a work in progress and that'll get teed up once the voice is back uh, incidentally the the list has come in really handy working with uh, Carol Gaffney on the uh, mass production uh, Two days ago, I picked up 100 masks from uh, from Peter Fleming and delivered them to Saint 100 masks to St. Matthew's House. So now we're turning our tar our sights on other organizations that are on the list um, to see if we can continue this as the as the team of mask makers continues to work. And that's it for community outreach. That's that's the primary focus right now. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Jim Carroll, Community Standards. Did I see Jim on? Yeah. It looks like he dropped off. No, Larry, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, um, my meeting ended uh, a little bit early, so I got on about 10 to 10. Um, just quickly, the Community Standards Committee uh, has finished all of its inspections. Roofs, sidewalks, driveways, um, and utility screenings, and of course uh, the mailboxes. And uh, right now we postponed sending any letters out to homeowners until the um, situation with the virus settles down a little bit. And we'll probably do that later on in May or June, whatever. As far as the mailboxes are concerned, the mail the handyman is doing a great job, getting great reviews, and he's heading along pretty well. Just the other day, I saw him driving past my house with about four or five redone mailboxes in the back of the truck. Um, and um, what we plan to do is work together in the fall with um, Steve DeLisi from Hawthorne and Bruce Baker from uh, Thornbrook to address the issue of uh, extra tall trees that are in both of those neighborhoods. We want to design a project a coordinated project with the two neighborhoods that would look like Manchester's project, whereby well, that's very nice. Uh, if we end up with a particular uh, tree or a number of trees in front of people, what will happen is that uh, the uh, homeowner will be notified that the tree is going to be trimmed and they'll be billed. And we're going to work out the details. Charlie again, Jamie has already given us uh, some of the documentation from Manchester, and we'll look forward to work that out in the fall. And that's pretty much it for uh, community standards until we get together again, probably in September. Any questions? Okay. Any, any questions for Jim? Thank you, Jim. Um, okay. crisis, crisis response. Um, Peter Fleming and, and Hal Hills aren't here today, but they, they did send a report which Ben sent out last night. And I'll just highlight great work they did. Um, it's really two separate things went on here, two separate, they were two separate initiatives, but they joined. One was the mask makers, and, and they're referred to, and I didn't know this, as the mask making mamas and papas. Um, and I guess they were Cal California dreaming or Florida dreaming, I'm not sure which, but um, uh, Carol Gaffney uh, did a fabulous job with a long list of people who, who were part of the mask making mamas and papas who put, uh, put together uh, well over 860 uh, masks. Uh, and and what, what impressed me about that 
it's impressive in, on its own, but there was an article in the, in the paper, the, in the news the other day, uh, one of the news channels, they were touting a local community here in North Naples that put together 500 masks, and uh, and we have well over 800 here. So, but they put all these masks together, and apparently, I think, they're still still constructing these masks, uh, and just a fabulous job. And and as I mentioned in my my report, it's just so Stonebridge that people would say, hey, there's a need. Let's get some people together and, and respond, and they did, and just continue to respond in a fabulous way. Um, then on the other side of that, the uh, the crisis response committee took those masks and then arranged the delivery of those. And we had it on uh, April 11th, April 8th, April 11th, and then uh, and then and then subsequent to that, uh, we made we made home delivery masks. And then Charlie, as he mentioned, he delivered some to St. Matthews, and I think Peter uh, was delivering some to NCH. 50, yes. 50 yesterday. NCH is using them when when uh, patients come into the hospital to, for an appointment. They give them these masks to uh, they don't already have their own to uh, protect them, so and protect the uh, the patients in the hospital. So it's just been a, just been a huge project and a great project. And as I said, it's really sort of typical of what uh, Stonebridge does. So uh, kudos to the to Carol and her team of mask making mamas and papas. And, uh, and also the, uh, the delivery angels and the uh, crisis response team that, that organized the delivery. It was a great effort and, uh, and it's something we can all be proud of that Stonebridge, it, it's kind of typical of the sort of things that Stonebridge does. So. The other benefit of that was as I delivered some of the masks and we contacted people to um, tell them and we put them on their doorsteps, I got to know some of the neighbors I didn't know by calling them and having, you know, just telling them not all of them, but many of them into a discussion about who we are and what we did, et cetera. So it was a good way to meet some neighbors oh, over great. the phone. Great. The other thing the committee is working on thinking about is that hurricane season is coming. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so there. It's in the category of good news. So. <laughs> but I know that it's an email because people are starting to leave. People that left right away, there are many of the eyes that are full of furniture. Mm -hmm. um, so there will, I think, be more emails going forward on that. Because that's going to be the form of thing that all the students in the court say there are going to be more hurricanes this season. Well, one other thing that, uh, that, I, I, that the crisis response committee is working on, uh, maybe just getting started, in that, and this is sort of a, a follow on to something. Carrington's doing is being aware of people who live alone in Stonebridge, in a home or a condo, or uh, and, and and somehow staying in touch with them so that we know how they're doing. And this is something that the crisis response team started with regard to hurricanes. You know, so we know who's during the hurricane. We know who's home alone and that sort of thing. So we know if there's any issues, we know where to go. Um, but this is more uh, a more general uh, concern for people that live alone and maybe don't have a lot of contact outside the home, uh, and keeping a big, staying aware of who they are and how they're doing. We had an unfortunate circumstance a couple of years ago in Thornbrook, and then uh, one in Carrington more recently, and it, that that sort of spurred the thought of again, typical of Stonebridge, what could we do about that? What what would be the right way to handle that? So um, more to hear from the crisis response team on that. I think that would be worthwhile. Okay, Dave, finance. Um, you've uh, received and reviewed the minutes for the finance committee on March 25. We'll find a reference in those minutes related to the FDA PPP. Uh, so because it did not exist. And only came into existence a week later, on the 27th of March. So I'm going to spend my time in this because things have changed rapidly. And to Jim's point, uh, to illustrate that, uh, we received our funding 19 days after the bill was passed. And that in the government time is pretty quick. Um, so last Friday, April 17th, the Finance Committee met. So let me summarize the current events and what the committee covered. We received the new 
We reviewed the large financial statements, which you received uh, and had a chance to review. Um, and you also received a summary of the uh, utilization report, so I'm not going to get into detail on that. Uh, March by itself is not is not helpful because it is a month where in-house dining was changed to take out on uh, March 19th, when the golf course changed from parks to walking March 26th towards the end of the month. So we have not yet felt a full month's impact from all the changes made. This current month, month of April, will give us the first full month financial impact of all these changes. So with that being said, we have for the month of March, we had a bottom line profit from operations of seventy-four thousand, but that was eighty-five thousand dollars, or fifty-four percent less than budgeted for the month. That puts us a bottom line loss from operations year to date of forty-five thousand, uh, or one hundred and fifty-two thousand under budget. During March, um, the revenue was budgeted five hundred ninety-four thousand. Um, and the direct expenses, though, were also under by the 60,000 or 28%. Most of the direct expenses, how was the cost? While the other operating expenses, which are mainly fixed costs, were 49,000 or 7% better than the so as you might imagine, during the month of April, we have been alongside management folks in priority on the SBA, EPP for April alone. The reforecasting of the 2020 budget based on operation <coughs> is a response to the pandemic we are facing. And then leading to the all important question on everyone's mind, how does this funding impact our membership sector? <clears throat> previously uh, discussed that, so I'm not going to get into much detail about that. Uh, let me first start with the SBA PPP forgivable loan funding. Uh, you all know the details by me. Uh, first thing is we owe a big thank you again to Tim and Debbie for their tireless efforts and frustrations. They endured <clears throat> receiving these files. Uh, the committee has been working closely with Tim and Debbie to help with uh, a few things. Number one, developing operational procedures that Stone Ridge will need to follow <laughs> compliance with the laws, rules, regulations, and intent of the PPP. Not only is this PPP a new animal by itself, the club has never had any involvement with government loans, grants, or subsidies in the past. So we're blazing new trails here, and we want to be cautious and conservative in our Being that this PPP program is so <clears throat> untested, there remains a ton of risks and uncertainties that we are working alongside management to help with, as Tim previously talked about. Management continues to pursue clarity through a series of resources beyond the auditors, legal, bank, SBA and networking with other other funders. Uh, we probably know more than they do. Um, this leads me back to financial statements because because of all of this uncertainty and because we want to stay on the conservative path. It is the opinion of the committee and management that we will simply thank received from us from the SP until <laughs> we assume there will be sufficient cash in the operation to be able to be longer. If not, we have funds sitting there that we can utilize without Hey, David, you're, David, you're distorting because somebody is not on so mute. It's true that next three months, in May and June, you will not see any of the PPP money reported. Hey. Management will be doing all the documentation, calculations, and we will perform the appropriate internal control review 
and he and the Yankees, which puts us, puts us uh, as Tim said, to about June 9th. You will continue to see the raw numbers in the under budgeted reporting at least through June. And it is likely you won't see any of that income coming through our financials even through August. Simply, uh, since the SBA has up to 60 days to review our flat application for forgiveness, the qualified expenses we incur in claim. That puts us into the middle of August before we hope to have our application for forgiveness approved and any unspent funds paid by repaid. Now, as Tim said, management has prepared reporting S miles with a series of assumptions and scenarios for when normal operations might occur and utilize the funds we project to keep as forgiven. As you know, and as Tim has said, returning normal to normal operations is somewhat in the hands of the county, state, and Washington. So pegging these scenarios and, and set assumptions is not possible yet. But that being said, we can somewhat be assured that had we not received the PPP funding, and assuming the government doesn't renege our eligibility and take back funds, this is my conservative nervous skeptic coming out. Uh, we were likely looking at a fairly significant assessment, but not now. To, the sooner we get the SBA sign off on forgiveness, the sooner we can use the funds uh, and offset those losses in income, and the sooner we can get back to normal operations, the smaller the risk and dollar amount of the assessment, since the funding only lasts about three months. So enough of that. Um, other key items that the Finance Committee um, worked on this month, we recommended and worked Management to secure a five-year agreement with our assembly, uh, who will continue to be our internal water. So that's a done deal. Uh, also, Joe Morrissey, our highly paid, our highly unpaid resident insurance <laughs> broker, has again produced hard work with Gulf Shore insurance brokers, helped our club achieve favorable rates on our July 1st insurance renewal policies. Although the broker continues to break out the last small pieces of the insurance package, the plan should be supposed to fire by the end of this month. We were told that other clubs were uh, incurring 20% rate increases, but with no joke, our brokers again, in fact, we offered early commitment. We will be around or slightly under a 15% overall increase. Um, also, one of the requests was, uh, what we, what's part of our plan for next year, for this year, 2020? Uh, some of these we've already uh, accomplished. One was uh, getting the insurance renewal plan done, the other was, um, was uh, the in external items, uh, getting that completed, those are accomplished. And also uh, streamlining the bank reconciliation and the journal entry and invoice review process. That has also been, been implemented. Um, so we're, uh, we're taking care of some of those things. The things that I think we're going to be more focused on this year are um, mostly reserve related. And there's three items that I'll just highlight. One is that we Hope to have an external reserve consultant to support the club's existing efforts to continually assess the adequacy of its capital reserve. Then also take on an active of front with committees and boards to evaluate and make recommendations for funding future club facility projects. And the other related to reserves is to uh, consider establishing a Contingency reserve line item for repair, replacement of existing capital assets that are not on the reserve schedule. So, those are the objectives of what are included in our rules this year. Some completed, many not. Any questions?
Good, good. I think, you know, just to back to Tim's point in his report about Stonebridge being financially strong and stable, and I think what Dave's talking about are the kind of steps that we have to be taking every day to make sure we stay that way. I think we're on the right path there. Well, great. Thank you, Dave. Um, Tom, golf and green? Sure. Um, well, as Tim mentioned, we, we've got a lot of golfers out there. Um, we are averaging over 150 rounds a day, uh, which is more, I think, than any of us expected. Um, Eric shared with me that of those rounds that are being played, 92% of them are, are is member play. The other 8% are renters and guests. Um, so we, we do have some renters still here and guests still here playing golf. Um, it's been about a month since we've been walking. Uh, for about the first 15 days of that, there was no charge. Um, I think beginning April 10th, we began to uh, charge $10 for walking the golf course. And, you know, the, the migration to this has been very smooth. Uh, people have been very cooperative in terms of social distancing. And so Eric and the Pro Shop have done a great job changing us from an, an almost an all carts club to right now all walking. Um, course conditions, uh, great job by Mark. I think he's had a fantastic year this year. Uh, the putting surfaces have been amazing all year long. Um, so I just have nothing but uh, good things to say about what he's done this year. In, in terms of what the golf committee hopes to be able to address uh, going forward, is, I guess our number one priority will be working with the board. Um, figuring out what Stonebridge Golf is going to look like as this pandemic uh, wanes, uh, how quickly to get, we get back to carts, what walking options will there be, how does the range get used. Um, secondly, um, we're looking forward to the cornerstone survey and uh, the committee will uh, work on how we react to that and its impact on course renovations. Um, and, I, and then our third main topic would be uh, continued uh, compliance with uh, posting of scores, uh, you know, with the new world handicap system. Um, we've not really gotten that off the, off the mark very well, um, but that, that will be one of the things we try to focus on next year. And then finally, just ongoing upgrades of the course conditions uh, for our members. So I, I think we're about in as good a shape as we can be in right now, given our challenges. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting more golfers out there as soon as possible. Good. Any comments or? I, it's something that we don't necessarily need to discuss here or now, but I, I've gotten a couple of comments from people wanting to know if we're going to expand the amount of walking available, available um, once we get back to normal. Apparently, some people have enjoyed, it turned out they enjoy walking on the course. So, and, and, you know, the, you, the course is different when you walk it than when you ride around in a car, for sure. And the, and it's the experience is different. So that's something that I'm sure will come up in the yeah. committee and discuss. Absolutely. I just want to say how impressive it is how many fit people in Stonebridge, all the know. walkers, bikers, <laughs> walking the course. I mean, it's just wonderful. It is. It is. It's a... Uh, Blue Zone showed up just in time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, okay. Charlie, anything on the grievance? I'm happy to report that I have nothing to report. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, how about grounds, facilities, and security? Yeah, the, the committee had a really active year last year. A um, lot of initiatives got completed, and the highlights of those are uh, Relandscaping the berms along Winding Oaks Way between the airport gate and the clubhouse. Uh, replaced all the pool furniture. Um, the uh, Master Association took over the common strip tree maintenance. Uh, we refurbished or, or you know, developed a plan to refurbish both entrances, which is planned for this summer. So that's that's just a, a smattering of what we did. And going forward this year, we we have a much less ambitious. Uh, set of goals uh, to uh, work on. I expect that to increase over time as things comes up uh, come up because that's often what happens. 
uh, with this committee. Um, we are um, going to follow up on the execution of the um, two gate gatehouse entrances. Um, I, you know, with a project like this, there's always going to be surprises, and some things may come back to the committee when problems or surprises arise. So we'll be on top of that. We're going to be exploring the replacement of dining room chairs, um, complete the perimeter fencing west of the Immokalee Road entrance. Uh, we're going to uh, see through the installation of security cameras in the clubhouse and fitness center. Some of that's been completed, I believe, and uh, dwelling live enhancements with additional cameras at both gates that will ena enable 24-hour um, monitoring of both locations. And then finally, patching and repair of roadway, uh, settling, and dips. So those are the objectives for this coming year. With the committee has not met. We don't have plans to meet at this point until things change. And that's okay. It. Yeah. Okay. Anybody get any questions for Charlie on the ground? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. As you come in on Winding Oaks Way, now looks really nice. It's okay. built in nicely. It's a huge improvement. Oh, yeah. Good job. Yes, it's, it's, it's really filled in and it looks terrific. Very much so. Big kudos to Mark. I'm not sure if yeah. on there, but big kudos to Mark. <laughs> All right, Betsy, House and Member Services. Yeah, the House and Member Services Committee has obviously not met. Um, there's a lot of other priorities at the moment. But I will just give you a little background about where we were and where we plan to go. The Synergy Solutions Survey results really drove the agenda for this committee in the 2019-2020 year. The survey demonstrated that while our dining venues are extremely well attended, member satisfaction was not the level we wanted it to be. The analysis of the survey identified areas that members wanted to see improved and an action plan, plan was developed over the summer and implemented in time for the uh, past season. The most important next step for this committee was to see if member satisfaction had improved. This was to be determined through a follow-up survey that was going to be sent out in April on the food and beverage operations to measure both satisfaction and shortfalls. Uh, with the coronavirus changing all of our lives, this sending out a survey is on hold. And I don't even know if Tim intends to send it out at all, um, but we'll find out. While we don't have a follow-up survey results to measure progress, it does appear that member satisfaction is trending in a very positive direction based on the monthly member communications Tim has received over the past six months. One observation that I've made and also is certainly um, stressed by all the industry leaders is the importance of having key positions filled with qualified people. September last year, Indra Muliana was hired as food and beverage manager with immediate and noticeable results in the front of the house service standards. Also in September last year, Megan Banks was hired as the sous chef a key back-of-the-house position assisting Chef Liam in managing the administrative and chef duties in two busy kitchen venues. Without a doubt, both of these key employees have had a direct impact on member satisfaction by making those areas work at optimal efficiency. Even without a follow-up survey, the results of the 2019 Synergy Solution Survey still remain a valuable tool in providing the framework of member expectations. The focus must remain on service standards, wait time, order correctness, menu variety, light fare, fresh and local, expanded hours of the grill room, heart healthy, grill room menu, all items members specifically identify. And while the dining satisfaction is a key driver of this committee, events play a very large role as Stonebridge has a very active social life. Committee members play a key role in events for in both creativity, design, and setup. For example, in the Welcome Back Cocktail Party, the New Year's Eve event, the fashion show, and other events throughout the year. 
Stonebridge is also planning a riverboat trip in uh, September of 2021. So that will be another thing this committee will be promoting uh, for the members. And that's about where we stand. Great. Thanks. Good. Any questions or comments? I, th I think it, it's been mentioned several times, but I think what, what the club has done, the food and beverage service has done with the takeout, switching to not only switching the meals, but the, what they serve and how they serve it and all of that has just been, been fabulous. But you, know, you mentioned this follow-up survey. It's unfortunate that's on hold because I think in January and February, the club, the food and beverage service has really hit its stride. I mean, they were just, it was bang, 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 you know, things were going great. And then this happened. So, but I'm sure. But the good news is we know where we need to go and we know what we need to do from that 2019 survey. That exactly. really was very critical in turning things around and getting the key employees in place and keeping them. Keeping That's them. really important to making this operation work because you cannot ask these employees <clears throat> to pick up the slack when there's not enough people covering the important key jobs. Right. I think that was really well demonstrated. Mm -hmm. We lost Jake and we lost the sous chef pretty much at the same time in the previous year. And that really set off the whole year on a bad right. tempo, yeah. but you can't hide. Right. So we were kind of, our hands were tied, right. but this year worked. Right, and I, and I think what Tim and the staff have done to keep the staff on the payroll during this difficult time is good because we, we got the, we, I think we got the team we were looking for, we finally got that assembled and then keeping them employed during this time was important. And that's part of I think, the goodness of the PPV is helps us keep everybody employed through the, through the time period, so. Okay, great, thank you, Betsy. Um, Kathy? Sure. Legal and governance? Legal and governance. Um, so legal and governance is going to continue to finalize to um, draft resolutions and articles to bring to the board for the May meeting. And uh, you may have noted um, that in the minutes it talked about bringing to the board in the April meeting. So I just want to correct that and I will correct it in the draft minutes that it is the May meeting that we'll be bringing those drafts to the board. And um, these uh, draft uh, resolutions and articles are a result of um, member concerns that were raised and a review by our attorney of um, these articles in the master de declaration. And um, once it's brought to the board, it will be reviewed, discussed, and uh, approved as drafts. And then we will bring it to the general membership where we will open up discussion with the general membership about these uh, articles, and then the general membership will make a vote on these. Mm -hmm. So that is the plan for that. Um, then we will continue to support the efforts of the strategic goals for um, management in the board. We will also continue to review and update as necessary the governing documents and bylaws as they come up during the year. And then um, we'll continue to support management and the board to ensure compliance with federal and state regulations as necessary. Good. Yeah, just uh, one other thing on PPP is we're fortunate not only to have Dave and, and all the finance committee, but a great finance committee and Dave's the right guy to be leading that this year, for sure. We've also got Kathy, who's got a, a huge amount of experience with compliance with government rules. And so, you know, Kathy's like, well, let me send you something. I want to show you something. <laughs> you know, she's, she's, she's very, very, very diligent on, the, on what the government rules are. And she just really, that's important because helpful, very helpful. So we got the right people on it because uh, Tim and Debbie are going to do a great job, I have no doubt. But it's good to have some knowledgeable people behind that and who have some experience in that area too. So thank you, Larry. Yeah, great. Um, and Sandy, the the two resolutions that uh, Kathy's talking about, we eventually take those to, if they, they, the board agrees with them, and we take them to the membership we'll have to have a communication plan to go with that. Yeah, 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 right. yeah we will need you. Yeah, all right. So. Okay, uh, nominating committee. Uh, <laughs> Stonebridge um, board meeting, yeah. and they're supposed to talk about the tennis courts. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, 
Uh, nominating committee, I don't want to seem overly anxious for this, uh, but the nominating committee for 2020, 2021, um, I've got five great uh, members of the, uh, four other members of the, uh, the uh, committee. Started an hour ago. And, uh, uh, first meeting is September 25th. So uh, talking about that. Uh, they've got, yeah, they've got the procedure. I sent out the procedure the other day. We've got, I followed on, this is really what Carolyn did. I followed on with hers and just uh, uh, added a few more details. But we've got a 21-step process, from, uh, starting with uh, with the, the appointment of the board March 27th to the election on February 24th. So also our first meeting is in September, and uh, we'll get underway, and we'll keep you appraised of that as we get started on that. Uh, Gail, strategic plan. Um, we had our first meeting on March 30th, and uh, we went over really the committee guidelines and the responsibilities as being members of the committee. And, and one of our um, responsibilities is to review the strategic <clears throat> action plan to make sure it's in line in the strategic action plan that the management team does to make sure that it's aligned with the mission and vision of, of Stonebridge. And so we're going to be doing that. Our primary, um, one of our primary goals though is to focus on the future. And we were tasked last year with putting together a five to 10 year master plan for the um, common areas of Stonebridge. And because of, well, one of the primary components that will feed into that was the member uh, facility planning survey that was sent out earlier in the year. And um, because of COVID, we have decided, I think all members have been informed that we have decided to defer receipt of this until the club is back fully operational. So it, so um, we're a little disappointed in that as we want to move everything forward and we are anticipating hopefully sooner than later that we can um, get those results and begin to start the build out of that plan using the Cornerstone project plus the input from management, realtors, from the member satisfaction survey, and any other feedback we receive. So um, we're just uh, waiting, sitting on pins and needles, waiting waiting to get those results. Yeah, we want to, at this point, we want to keep our attention on safety, people's mm -hmm. safety and comfort. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we all also want to make sure that we roll the uh, Cornerstone survey out in an appropriate way with uh, with the marching band and all of that, and right. this is the time for marching band. So, and I think you know, we don't want we want don't want to be distracted by other things that are going on because the, this plan will really be focused on things that are going to happen about three years down the road. So we don't want to get confused with what the future is with what the current exactly. current environment is. Exactly. Yeah. I appreciate the strategic planning committee's patience with all of that, but uh, they'll they'll have their time. They'll, they'll have their time. Uh, Jim, you still there? You, can you do the tennis and fitness? Uh, I am still here, and hopefully you all can hear me. Um, the uh, as you may know, I'm the. This is the first year that I'm chairing the tennis and uh, fitness committee, and uh, unfortunately, because of uh, too few rooms in the club and the fitness center, Gail. <clears throat> we couldn't hold our first meeting the first week of April. So, but during the summer, um, what I plan to do is meet with Kevin and Jeff to talk about their plans for the coming season. And I'll share those plans with our committee and we'll have a full discussion. In addition to our usual planning for special events and tournaments and things like that, I want to focus this year's committee's efforts a little bit more on the fitness side of things, including the activities of the Blue Zone. And as you all know, uh, given the age of our membership here and the popularity of Jeff's efforts so far, uh, it's clear that keeping our members healthy is important and something that we need to focus on more. And that's something that the members want more. So we too are also waiting for the Cornerstone survey results to see uh, what the membership might be willing to pay for. And that's pretty much it. And any suggestions you all have regarding anything else we need to talk about at the Tennis and Fitness Committee, uh, any suggestions are welcome. 
Okay. Uh, good. With, with regard to questions um, that members may have, uh, I know we don't have the system set up for feedback here, but if you would uh, ask, email Tim or, or, or me uh, if you have any questions uh, from this meeting or others, and we'll get them out to the right person to answer it and take care of that. Uh, so we, we encourage the feedback. We just don't have a system set up for that uh, online, but, but we, can, we can certainly handle it uh, otherwise. So I appreciate all the committee chairs going through the uh, what their uh, what their plans are, what their main objectives are for the next year, for this next year. And I think it's an, it's important first of all that we remember that we're faced with a real uh, challenge of uh, this uh, virus, and we need to uh, focus first and foremost on the protection and safety and uh, comfort of our members to the extent we can we can impact that. But we don't want to forget that we have a we have a terrific club here. We have uh, what we think is the best bundle community in Southwest Florida. We're going to continue to have that. And so in order to do that, we need active committees who have plans and who have things that they're going to do and, uh, and, and they uh, get to it. So that's part of the reason I wanted to make sure we went through the committee reports today is to remind ourselves that we, we, have, uh, we have a lot going on and, uh, and the, the, the committees are really essential to, uh, to being the kind of club we want to be. So shortly we'll be back to normal, uh, hopefully, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, you know, Gail, I mean, Sandy mentioned that uh, Katie said we should have a cocktail party, and I so thought now that'd be a good idea, but but not not today. But that no. but it is a good idea. And someday yeah. we'll all be back to gather around the bar here. Uh, oh, back to doing back some of these driveways. Doing some of these driveway, right? <laughs> and and there's more and more of that driveway talk going on, and I I, I think the that's the way I can tell the natives are getting restless. You know, mm -hmm. every, every, you go for a walk, there's more and more neighborhood driveway parties, uh, all at six foot distances. Okay, any uh, so that wraps up the committee reports. Any new business? Anything we need to bring up here? New business, but I wondered what's happening with the H2B stuff and flights. Are they going back to first remaining? Oh, uh, the issue is flights. So they, uh, Jamaica actually doesn't have any flights going in. We're shooting for the 15th, which is starting in May. We've got some flights on different. We had some flights go from JetBlue, which was special plans to cancel by JetBlue because they don't want to fly any planes back from Jamaica to the States. So it's, we're, we're, we're figuring out, but we should have everybody back on Monday. Oh, we're going to pay that through uh, Correct. And then, okay. Good work. Good. Yeah. Good. Driving back to Chicago. The delivery vehicle. We'll see them delivering <laughs> meals at night. It's wonderful to see them because we miss everybody. Yeah. Now they're there. Okay, great. Um, so member comments, uh, as I mentioned, uh, email Tim uh, or me uh, with the comments and we'll answer them or get them to the right person to get them answered. Uh, but we do uh, welcome uh, member comments and questions. Is there anything else that we need to talk about? Okay. Well, uh, next meeting is May. I don't know the exact date, but it's around the same time of the month, uh, 20 May 22nd. So. And we'll use the same format that we're using today. I think, I, think, I think we should use the same one at this. Hopefully I think not. this worked well. Uh, and I have a year. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to meet. Have a real oh. meeting. Oh, yeah. instead of being yeah. on go to, that's what I meant. Yeah. Oh. Well, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think this, the thing I like about this go to is you, you see the people who are signed up on there. And I think we may be getting a little broader uh, participation this way than we get in person, perhaps. So. Yeah. I just mean with us time. meeting around the table. Right. I really right. feel a lot better when we're all together. Oh, yes. Right. Exactly. For sure. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. 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 All right. Very good. Well, then I can get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Have a great day. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you, Ben. Meeting in person is always better.